I'm Kyle Jensen and thanks for coming to look at this site. The topic is Florida surface water and surface water in general and it's not in good shape and you know it doesn't have to be this way. It's this way because of the people that we have managing it. Look, almost all of the world's surface water is polluted with fertilizer. This is nitrogen and phosphorus that are added to uh, plantings and farms and uh, landscapes and because of impervious surface area when rain falls down this material washes into surface water and it takes a handful of elemental phosphorus to pollute a 50 acre lake to turn a 50 acre lake from pristine into nothing but pea soup so look here's my elevator pitch we've got all this polluted water we're going to take the plant material that's consumed or absorbed the pollution in the water, we're gonna take that out of the water and we're gonna make soil out of it. Now, why do we wanna make soil? 33 square miles of soil in the United States erode and go out to sea. So by using this method, we can have clean water and we can amend our soil bank. So what are we gonna plant in this soil and why is that important? There's so many things that can be planted in this biological material, this slurry, bio-slurry that we call, that comes out of surface water. Some of the crops are food crops, uh, pear trees and almond trees, other uh, DOT sod products, wildflowers. Uh, one of the most exciting things is bamboo. Um, we've adapted bamboo culture to receiving this uh, slurry, this bio slurry. It provides uh, the moisture the plants need and the organic amendments. And once you plant bamboo, it keeps producing stalks forever. Bamboo can be and is now manufactured into some of the finest materials, softer than a thousand thread count sheets. It also makes a great pulp for making molded fiber products or paper products. And I don't have to tell you how many handcrafts and, and floor tiles and, and pieces of framing lumber can be made out of bamboo. Uh, all of this uh, absorbs carbon dioxide and it uh, removes pollution from the water and it builds soil and I want you to be for it but guess what right now it's against the law because during the aftermath of Vietnam squatters had a flotilla in Key West and so the state legislature wrote uh, statute 18.004 point something else and it says that you can't have a non-essential occupancy over a sovereign submerged land. So I'm proposing, and what makes this different, is I'm proposing to develop sovereign submerged land. This is land that belongs to all of us Floridians. And with a minuscule development of this property, we can raise revenue through leasehold. And this revenue can go to fund the several technologies that already exist to remove nutrients from surface water. Listen, whether it's at the St. John's River or whether it's at Lake Okeechobee at the Caloosahatchee River or south to the Everglades or east to Palm Beach, we can make the water so clean that the scientists are going to be saying, hey, the water's so clean that downstream organisms are suffering. It can be done and it can be done now, but there's no way to pay for it unless we develop our sovereign submerged lands. Let me see if I can be a little bit more accurate with that statement. It's not that the Florida government can't raise large amounts of money. It's just been very, very difficult in the past for them to do it. It's politically unpopular. Uh, the one exception was the Everglades restoration, which um, in that case we were being sued by the federal government. But you see, our government has a time scale of every four years or every eight years we get a new governor and our ecosystems have a time scale of about 40,000 years and so unless we come up with a solution that's a little bit closer to the time scales then I don't think we're going to make much progress. And I thought our politicians were a little bit smarter about this until I visited with some of them recently. My senator from Seminole County seems to think that the, the state has all the money that they need to write a check to do surface water improvement. I can tell you that the state does not have the money to protect and improve our surface water. But we as Floridians have an unlimited supply of sovereign submerged lands that we can use and we can develop if we want to and we can improve the surface water quality with existing technologies. So let me tell you about our plan to improve Florida surface water uh, without burdening taxpayers. Uh, we have almost an unlimited supply of sovereign submerged land here in Florida. And uh, we should develop this land sustainably and responsibly to generate the money that's required to filter our surface water. 
Um, so the goals of this effort is to develop sovereign submerged lands that can pr produce revenue that can be used to improve water quality. And so this water quality improvement is totally funded by the development. And the developments are also capable of leaving without a trace. They are manufactured off-site and they are moved into place and key, can be removed and you'd never ever know they were there. So remember that this sovereign submerged land belongs to all of the people of Florida. And if the people of Florida want clean water and they want to develop this land to get there, then I think we have to honor that. So what, what I proposed first is a development in a location where the water comes to us. And that's really important. Uh, and we would have start out with uh, 250 floating home sites. Uh, they would be situated in Lake Monroe as shown in this slide. So this is the revenue generating portion of the project. Eventually, the uh, development will be built out as you see here. And this is the amount of home sites that would be required to raise the money to filter the St. Johns River. Now, uh, these floating homes are accessed from uh, a shore station that's underneath the I-4 interchange on the south side of uh, Lake Monroe, um, there at the mouth of the St. Johns River. And electric water taxis are always available to take people to their homes. And that doesn't stop, of course, other people from uh, using their own private boats to get to and from their homes. This is an animation, it's a little bit jerky, but let me play it here. This is if we were taking off from the St. Johns River Bridge, and then we're flying over to see the first development marinas. And as the animation plays, I think it gives you a real um, excellent perspective of how small this development is at the scale of Lake Monroe. And the marinas have a nice walkway with a shore station at either end, lift station at one end. All of the piping is run securely in double walls down to the lift station. And so here you see, uh, we can put quite a lot of real estate safely and sustainably in Lake Monroe. And the revenue that that generates can be life-changing for the quality of our water. So, how are we actually going to remove this planktonic algae from the water? Remember that the planktonic algae absorbed pollution, mostly nutrients, and contains it in its cell walls. And these little cells are um, microscopic, and so all you see is green water. Now one method of removing these algal cells that I've worked with a lot is the flotation method. You make tiny little air bubbles and then they're released in the water along with a small amount of charge altering chemistry. This is important because the algal cells have repelling charges and what we do with this charge altering substance is remove that so that they come together in a flake and thereby we can remove them uh, either by flotation or with a new system we don't have to use chemicals, we can use just electricity and we can settle or float them. So we have the slide up here. This is a public document and I was a co-founder of Aquafiber Technologies uh, where I worked at, developed and innovated the dissolved air flotation filter uh, until I was forced out in 2012. And so here's the executive summary and they report to the Water Management District that by removing plankton, they're able to greatly improve water quality and so uh, leave this in here so that um, you know that uh, if you have any questions about that that it's a well-known reported fact that the water management district and the engineers out there in the world all acknowledge so here is a little results of a little experiment done with electrocoagulation on water at Lake Jessup and uh, the circled line there shows uh, the optimal performance and so uh, the filtration performance that I'm going to show you a little later on in this presentation is based on this performance and this electric electricity level and uh, this total phosphorus and total nitrogen removal rates of 95.4 and 64 percent. So that's what this slide goes into. There you see the little algal cells. Uh, I don't know the name of this specific one, uh, but it's obviously produ reproducing. Now, electrocoagulation does have a sacrificial steel plate. 
and so technically iron is an element and so I have a hard time uh, putting that in the category with chemical treatment because it's such a ubiquitous metal uh, that's used uh, throughout all of our infrastructure. Uh, but electrocoagulation at this scale uses a lot of electricity. Uh, but that's not so bad because in this case it's provided by the adjacent power plant off peak. And that means that when a power plant runs more con consistently, uh, then it does a whole lot better economically. And so uh, this is actually something that's good for the power plant. Uh, and then in the uh, case where we would be filtering outflow water from Lake Okeechobee, it would be easy to drive the system with a solar array. And, uh, you know, that's really good because um, I don't have to worry about the carbon that's de developed from uh, the fossil fuel plant. So development of this land can occur any place. It's, we got, and this particular site has a lot of real special things going for it. Uh, I mentioned the power plant is adjacent to it and we'd be a large consumer of power. So we don't have to have transmission lines to speak of any distance. Um, we also have the water coming to us, which is one of the problems that uh, my company Aquafiber ran into when they had a large filtration system and they had a plummet with a huge pipe. You know, the water becomes cleaner and then uh, you really need uh, to move the intake around and that's not really realistic to do. So having the water come to us is one of the things that's critically important. And of course, this has got the infrastructure of I-4. Um, the land exists and is for sale for a marina. Um, we also have the Sanford Water Treatment Plant, which is on the south side of the lake, and a submarine line would uh, empty all of our uh, lift stations uh, just the way they do in a subdivision, except we pump through double wall containment pipe uh, to be sure that there's never a spill. You might wonder where we're going to park all of these cars, and while we do plan to have a parking facility at the I-4 uh, shore station or marina, uh, we also are interested in parking cars at the uh, Sanford Mall, which has a large paved parking lot that's uh, drastically underutilized these days. So as I mentioned, the, um, bar, the, all of the marinas and uh, walkways are manufactured off-site and they're floated into place and they have articulated footings that attach them to the bottom. Uh, and all of this is uh, very typical in marine engineering. Um, our foundations are planned to be synthetic concrete and uh, we have some interesting uh, foundation details that um, will become uh, really important for these houses as they remain in place over time. Here are a list of pros and cons. Um, you know, we're basically going to be cleaning the river. It costs the taxpayers nothing. There'll be a lot of revenue for uh, Sanford because you'll be moving 2,000 homes into that area that will be luxury homes. Like I said, it leaves without a trace and it, it causes the Sanford power plant to become more economical. On the con side, uh, in this location without a solar array, we do have the CO2. Um, there is barge traffic in the river that I'll get to that uh, is not there now. Uh, boat traffic on Lake Monroe, um, even though we have the water taxis, they and the other boats will increase the boat traffic. Uh, one of the things that's important to me is that we have an ironclad garbage and trash pickup uh, system because you wouldn't have to blow too much trash around uh, on the windy Lake Monroe before you'd have a real litter problem. And while it is marginally viewable from coastal properties, we tried to keep it away from view. Um, that still is a potential con. Um, sewage system leaks, we talked about that being a real minor element. Uh, and it does shade a very minor portion, less than 1% of the bottom of Lake Monroe. But currently Lake Monroe has um, such poor light transmission, not much light gets to the bottom anyway. So I really think you could argue that point. And there would be some minor nutrients from the impervious surface area on the marina and homes too. So electric coagulation is like a big battery in reverse. You've got these steel plates in the water and you put two volts DC across each plate gap. Um, we're planning on these units only operating uh, on a 50% duty cycle. 
Um, you do need to know that the plates have to be acid washed uh, at the end of the cycle, but uh, the acids were used and uh, dealt with responsibly. And you know, this is something that's uh, fully automated but observed so that we don't have problems. Yeah, it's a lot of voltage, uh, 2300 volts, three phase at 2000 amps is transferred into two and a half volts DC across each place gap. And then the plates need to be replaced on an annual basis. So that's an operating cost that we also have to cover. Um, we will consume 200 megawatts, which is one tenth of the Sanford power plant generating capacity, a lot of power. And here you see those barges, uh, not uh, about half the size of a football field, maybe a, a third of the size of a football field, four of them in place, uh, 48 filters in all, uh, taking up a very minuscule area of uh, Lake Monroe shore and uh, operating from the power plant adjacent the site. And this is a little uh, summary table that shows the economics of uh, what kind of money we're generating and what kind of costs we have, uh, expenses that we have to uh, construct a terminal and uh, put marina docks in place and put utility systems in place and uh, build a terminal parking area and over by the St. John's River Bridge. Um, and then we have the filtration system, very expensive to build, and uh, we have to install a little shore power system. I say little in jest. Uh, and then there's some reoccurring costs. There's the cost of the operation, operations. We do have to replace those plates. And then also what I want to get into now uh, towards the tail end of the presentation is, is what we do with all that stuff we take out of the lake because if you can't solve that problem then this is not sustainable and we're not interested in Florida and anything that's not sustainable. Yeah so look at the totals here uh, that's 11,000 pounds 11,500 pounds of hundred dollar bills uh, but you know you could see um, 522 million dollars over the 20 year lifespan is 26.1 million and uh, I have debt service at 0% right now just because I want you to see you know, what you get as far as filtration for uh, development. Uh, we've got 19 million in here for operations, etc. And that totals, and uh, we got a little bit of a surplus. And so yeah, what are we gonna do all of that with all of that wet biomass? Um, it could be considerable here, you know, um, 63 by 63 by five feet deep. And you know it could be twice that much. And so, uh, what we've done in the past, and what we've been successful with, is using this bio slurry uh, as an agricultural material. And so, uh, these biosolids are harvested and transported via a barge from the filtration plant on a daily basis to a farm. Uh, the farm has a basin that's lined, and the biosolids are pumped into that basin. And that basin feeds a series of primary and lateral ditches that uh, serve to distribute uh, that biomass out. Uh, in the case of sod culture, what we've been successful at doing is just flooding an area, not laterals, but flooding an area and sprigging it. And then as the plants develop into the algae, the roots grow, the water is bio uh, transpirated at a higher rate than evaporation and is uh, quickly consolidates uh, about a foot, 18 inches of bio slurry into uh, four inches of really nice soil. And uh, this works well in a sod culture application. But there's so many other things we can grow, wildflowers and uh, indigenous plants. And um, we really need to think about this as an agricultural resource. And here you see the scheme uh, where we pump into lateral ditches and we culture bamboo. Uh, bamboo is an exciting crop because once you plant it, 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 you just keep harvesting and harvesting and harvesting. And while there is a little bit of maintenance involved, uh, bamboos uh, sequester four times more seed carbon than uh, trees. And so, uh, you know, they grow very rapidly and uh, they can be manufactured into fiberboard, floor tiles, uh, paperboard that you can mold. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of handicrafts that the world has seen come out of places like Indonesia where bamboo crops are plentiful. There's just so much you can do with it. So we're taking pollution out of the water and we're making soil out of it and we're growing carbon sequestering plants 
that uh, have use in manufacturing. So at this point in my presentation, I asked the Water Management District and the DEP, you know, what's it going to take for me to get a permit? And um, some interesting conversation ensued, but about two weeks later, I got a letter from the DEP telling me that a non-essential occupancy on a sovereign submerged land is prohibited by Florida Statute 18, and uh, so that they couldn't even work with me. And so here we've got a solution to Florida's water quality problems, and it's against the law. So. Um, that leaves us challenged and in a position where we need to get a senator on board to introduce a bill to give us a waiver or uh, change the language in Statute 18. And that's what I'm interested in you helping me do by writing letters uh, to our senators and encouraging them to look into the development of sovereign submerged lands for the purposes of water quality improvement. Thanks a lot for listening to this presentation. Any questions, I'm happy to answer them. My contact information is all over this video. So what needs to happen? You need to write your senator and you need to write Governor DeSantis and you need to tell him that we're for the development of sovereign submerged lands. You need to tell him we're tired of substandard Florida water quality. You need to tell them the red tide is going to drive every tourist that comes to the state away. And you know, even though the red tide is cultured in the bowels of the Gulf of Mexico, it moves around to where nutrients are plentiful. And right now, nutrients are plentiful at the Florida coast. So, senators, this summer, if the red tide takes off, you really need to think about backing up and taking a look at the development of sovereign submerged lands towards water quality improvement. Thanks a lot for listening to this pr presentation. Please write your congressman. Feel free to call me and contact me if you'd like to talk further about it. Have a good day.